Good morning. Yesterday I brought to your attention the fact that this class is really a God miracle. And uh, what you experienced yesterday was another proof of that miracle because for the first time in the entire class experience of over 12 years, our work went through two solid hours without even a stop to breathe or walk or rest, and that has never before happened. Also, it will interest you to know that many of our classes consist of only one-hour sessions, and yet ours was a two-hour session and one that went straight through without interruption and you were all quiet enough so that it did not disturb whatever it was going on in me. This is a miracle. This is a miracle. There are very few who can sit even for one hour in complete peace. And uh, although our students have proven that they can, we have never tested them for two straight hours as we were tested yesterday. So that I again say to you that something is taking place in this classwork that at this moment is not visible to us, about which we have no knowledge, but which will in due time be made evident to us. In other words, God assembled this class. God is giving this class, and uh, the activity of God must result in what to human sense would be miracles. Of course, there are no miracles to God. It's the normal, natural spirit spiritual way of God, but to our limited sense, every spiritual miracle is a miracle, is marvelous, is wonderful, and uh, awe-inspiring. Therefore, let me ask you to accept the fact that you are not merely participating in an infinite way class, but rather that in some way we do not yet know you are participating in a, a direct activity of God under God's guidance and direction and protection, and that out of this experience each one of us who has been led to the experience will find the reason that we have been brought to the class at this time. Now, yesterday, you will remember that we touched briefly on the nature of God. I'm going to touch on that again because without the correct understanding of the nature of God, none of the principles of the infinite way will uh, ever be clear to you nor will you rightly understand how they operate or why. No one can ever understand this message of the infinite way unless they know the nature of God 
as it has been revealed in this work. The nature of God is nothing like what the human race has ever believed. It is for this reason that with the exception of a few chosen souls, no one in 1700 years who has gone to church to pray has ever prayed to God. They have prayed to a concept of God. It may have been their own concept of God. It may have been their church's concept of God. It may have been their own minister or priest or rabbi's concept of God, but it was never God. Of that you may be sure by this. There has never been a prayer to God that has not been instantaneously answered. It would be an impossibility to reach God and not instantly receive the answer. When we do not receive answers to prayer, it is because, as we were taught in Scripture, we have not prayed aright. Or, as Paul said, this God whom ye ignorantly worship him declare I unto you. Now, the true God of whom we read in Scripture, it is said, to know him aright is life eternal. This true God, if you know him aright, you have attained your entire life's demonstration. You have no other demonstration to make. To know God aright is the demonstration of life eternal. That must mean life harmonious, life abundant. Therefore, you may assume that until spiritual harmony begins to unfold in your experience, that you do not yet know God aright and that you are not praying aright. We need not concern ourselves about praying aright because when you know the nature of God, when you know God aright, it brings with it the understanding of how to pray. Now, to begin with, God has nothing to give you, and there is no use of going to God for anything. If you will think for a moment of the sun in the sky, you will realize that the sun is shining and that from the sun there emanates warmth and light. And now how would you feel if someone told you to pray for warmth or light? Or supposing that it were nighttime and the sun has gone to a different quarter of the world and someone were to ask you to pray for the sun to shine now. Now you cannot pray for impossibilities, nor can you receive impossibilities. The sun cannot shine at night where you are at night if all of the greatest souls in the world were to pray for it at once. In other words, it cannot change its course because in the beginning, before Abraham was, 
God set the course for the movement of the sun, the earth, the planets, and all that concerns it, and you can never change this. In the same way, you cannot pray that your orange trees produce roses because you like roses more than orange trees or oranges. You cannot pray that two times two be other than four, even if sometimes it might save a friend or relative from going to jail if you could just fix their books for them. But you can't. You cannot pray to God to change the orbit or activity of God's work or world. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. To try to enlighten God as to your needs is foolishness, for God is the all intelligence of this universe. God is the creative principle, the maintaining and sustaining principle and who would dare believe uh, that their knowledge so far transcends God's that they would dare tell God, I need rent on Saturday, or I need health, or I need supply, or I need companionship. God, being the infinite power of this universe, cannot be influenced. Therefore, Anyone who believes that their prayers will influence God to send forth health, harmony, wholeness, completeness, companionship, or supply to anyone has little understanding of the nature of that great infinite divine intelligence and divine love, which God is. God cannot be influenced. God cannot be bribed. There are still those who believe that if they tithe, it will cause God to do something for them. This is heresy. Tithing is one of the most wonderful experiences that ever can come into the human life. Any individual who has ever been led to tithe, that is to set aside a proportion of their earnings or income for an impersonal purpose, whether for spiritual, whether for church, whether for benevolence, knows that there is no greater blessing uh, to be enjoyed on earth, but not because it induces God to do anything for us, but because it releases us from the belief that we need a hundred percent of what comes to us, and because it releases us from the selfishness that makes us believe uh, that we do not owe divine love to our neighbor, that we do not owe a debt to our neighbor even when our neighbor is an enemy. Probably one of the reasons that our great Herbert Hoover has reached this magnificent age of 85 in full possession of his faculties and at the very height of his mental capacities and in good physical health is due to the fact that all of his life he has felt that it was a demand upon him personally and upon all mankind 
to help those who at the moment could not help themselves even when they were enemies. He brought upon himself great censure during and after World War I because some of the supplies entrusted to him were sent into enemy hands. But to him, friend or enemy, they were either God's children or they were human beings, fellow beings, and all entitled to eat. After all, we were enemies of those enemies. But when you tithe, please do not believe you are pleasing God. Remember, you are bringing yourself into accord with the laws of God, which is a law of love, and you benefit by it. It brings great blessings. So it is that you can never look to God for anything except the understanding that God is already fulfillment God is already performing its functions. God already is the great intelligence and the divine love. But you can bring yourself into attunement with God and the laws of God. And that is the function of our work. Now, Jesus Christ, who is actually the way shower who actually is the teacher, the exemplar, the foundation of this infinite way work, has taught us not to go to God, seek not what you shall eat or what you shall drink or wherewithal you shall be clothed. Your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of these things and it is his good pleasure to give you the kingdom therefore seek God and his righteousness and these things will be added unto you then he tells us if you pray for your friends it profiteth you nothing Pray for your enemies that you may be the children of God. Well, children of God are heirs. They are joint heirs with Christ and God. And the moment that you are a child of God, you have no needs, you have no desires, you have only fulfillment because as the child of God, you no longer earn your living by the sweat of your brow you inherit it. In other words, it has a way of coming to you without labor, not without work. Don't forget, the further we go in this work, the harder we'll work. But that isn't labor, that's love, that's divine activity, that's joy. In the same way, he teaches forgive. 70 times 7. Forgive. Do not hold anyone in condemnation, even the woman taken in adultery or the thief on the cross or even Judas Iscariot. Rather, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It makes no difference whether they're stealing, robbing, cheating. It makes no difference whether it's adultery in one form or another. It makes no difference what form of sin it is. It's all done in ignorance. There are no spiritually enlightened people who do those things. Therefore, it must be those who are in spiritual darkness. Can you not forgive them when you know that what they're doing, they're doing only through their ignorance and for no other reason, because they don't know any better. They do not know how spiritually to attain their good. 
Now you see, by obedience to these teachings of Christ Jesus, and I'm going to refer you to the Sermon on the Mount, you will find that you no longer have to pray to God, or, let me say it in a different way, that your prayer will take a different form. You will still pray, but your prayer will be a different form, and uh, your good will unfold to you without effort without even mental or spiritual effort because there will be a presence going before you to prepare the way, to make the crooked places straight, to uh, provide all that is necessary for the journey. You need not take personal script. Once you have come into obedience to the Christ principles which make you heir of God. So that our work does not consist in getting God to do anything for us. It consists of a spiritual preparation of ourselves to be fitted to receive the grace of God. Now the grace of God cannot enter the mind or consciousness of an individual bearing uh, hate, greed, lust, animality, or these intense selfish modes and means of life. Oh yes, when there is an inner longing for God that transcends one's evil. Let me put it this way. It really makes no difference how evil a person is at any given moment. It really makes no difference what their present sins of omission or commission may be. They need make no effort to get rid of them or to stop them. If within them there is the desire to know God aright, no one need engage in psychological means to change their nature or to repress their evil instincts or their evil thoughts. As a matter of fact, these never succeed. You must always remember that our greatest, when I say greatest, I mean in name, psychologists have openly acknowledged that they have never yet witnessed a healing through psychology and only last week a meeting of psychiatrists acknowledged that they have never yet witnessed a healing through psychiatry. So there is just no use of applying the psychological or psychiatric approaches to your life since at least up to this present moment no principle has been discovered in them which could help you. Now, incidentally, at our conference last year, five of Europe's great psychiatrists attended. The object of the conference was to discover if spiritual power could be exerted on human affairs. These five great psychiatrists came because they hadn't found any human way even in psychiatry to meet the problems of human affairs. Only a few years ago we were sent for by the head of a mental institute who is one of the big name psychiatrists of the United States who said that he has never yet witnessed the healing through psychiatry and is now investigating the subject of spiritual healing and wanted to spend an evening with us to talk about it. On a lecture trip last year in Indianapolis, another psychiatrist attended the lecture, one connected with the mental institute there, and came to me afterward and said, in 10 years in this institute, I've never witnessed a healing. 
through any medical means and I'm searching for spiritual help and uh, next week it will be my pleasure to be at one of the largest mental institutes in this state where I have been invited because there are 30 students of the infinite way there and they have shown so much in healing and harmony that some of their families have been brought into the study of the infinite way the head of the educational bureau has written me that his entire life has changed and so I'm invited there now I have had experience in mental institutes with mental patients I've had experience in prisons and so I speak to you from 30 years of experience and I say that if you or any of your friends or relatives are in sin don't try to stop it or correct it but rather see if you cannot awaken in them or yourself a desire to know God because that's all that's necessary when the realization of God takes place in you whether you were taken in adultery whether you were the thief on the cross whether you were Judas Iscariot you are instantly made free in other classes I have told our students that when my first spiritual experience came to me I enjoyed every facet of human life that businessmen enjoy especially traveling men and I traveled Europe and America and I knew the so-called good things of life the joys of cards the joys of a horse race the joys of a drink the all of the joys that are normal to the human being and yet which in our understanding now completely disappears and is made of no value and in that one brief second of spiritual light every bit of that human sense of existence passed away now since then I have had the opportunities of working with men and women who were more active in sin than I was more active in what the world calls sin and I've witnessed that same thing in them that when that moment of realization came yesterday was dead and all of its desires all of its fears all of its false appetites so I say to you in your spiritual studies don't study to get well or to become pure or to become spiritual don't 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 waste time that way just study to come to know God aright to experience God to have the conscious awareness of the presence of God and then you will find that what I quoted last night is true where the Spirit of the Lord is there is liberty where the presence of the Lord is where the consciousness of God's presence is there is liberty there's a complete and immediate freedom from physical limitation mental moral and financial limitation it all drops away because you cannot be in the presence of God and in the presence of error at the same time that's an impossibility therefore with all your getting get the realization of God's presence and above all things and I think this is one of the most important things develop a love for God now in my experience I find very few who write to me in the earlier days of their study 
have even any thought about a love for God. Their entire attention is on attaining physical, mental, moral, or financial freedom, or gaining companionship, or gaining employment, or supply. And uh, they think of God as a means to that end. But rarely do I find in the first, second, or third year of a person's study that God is the object. Not the means to an end, but the end itself. And yet this is the message of the infinite way. The message of the infinite way is not a going to God for something. It is not a reaching God for something. It is attaining God. And that's all. For to know him aright is life eternal. I saw years ago that many uh, people came to me with uh, the idea, for instance, that they were sitting in a chair here as the patient, I was sitting in a chair here as a practitioner, and probably I prayed uh, to God, and then God's grace came down to them over here. And uh, that's a mistake. Because of omnipresence, there is no here, there, and there. For I am, God is, and I don't have to go anywhere even mentally to reach God because I and the Father are already one. The place whereon I stand is already holy ground. So there's no going up or out or to. It is merely the realization of withinness. And there is no patient here and a practitioner here. That also is an illusory picture. The reason is that since God is infinite, there cannot be a patient or a practitioner. There can only be God infinitely manifested as individual being. And the realization of that wipes out a patient without a funeral service. Now, <clears throat> for the benefit of those of you who have studied the mental sciences, either religious science or mind science, I would like to say that this is a completely different field of activity than the one I am revealing to you in the infinite way because it is true that with the power of the mind you can produce effects in the human world. I know that because I have studied not your mental sciences, but I have gone back to those who originally were the masters of the mind, those who knew and practiced the powers of the mind and know far more about it than what you are studying. And I do know this, that with the power of your mind, if you would imbue your mind with statements of truth, affirmations of truth, realizations of truth, you could produce harmony for yourself, your relatives, your friends, patients, students. There's no question about that. But I also call your attention that this is not God living or God healing for this reason. 
You can use the power of your mind for evil. Your mind will work equally for evil or for good, whichever way you determine to direct it. Of course, it may be that you have an innate nature, and undoubtedly you have or you wouldn't be in this class, which would not permit you to use your mind for that purpose, but that doesn't mean you couldn't if you wanted to. In other words, there are people in this world using their mind for evil purposes, for selfish purposes. Sometimes you may not be willing to uh, describe it all as evil, but people who manipulate the mind to sell a product are using that power selfishly even if the product is a good one. And uh, there is always the potentiality of uh, the use of the mind for personal or evil purposes. That has all been witnessed so often in the metaphysical world that it requires no enlargement upon at this moment. <coughs> so that I say this to you, <coughs> the infinite way does not deny those mental teachings in uh, any claim that you cannot mentally produce healings or good I have witnessed too much of that so that I know it can be done. I know it also, the mind and its thoughts can be used for evil purposes, erroneous purposes, destructive purposes. And therefore, I say to you that our interest in the infinite way is not in using the power of mind even for good. Because our work takes us into a dimension where there is neither good nor evil, where there is only spiritual activity and being. That is the major function of our work. I wrote a book review <clears throat> on a book which was written by a minister. in which he said that he made experiments with plants and found that prayer would help to grow them and prayer could be used to destroy them. Now you know, of course, that that's not true. There's one of you here who have any right to believe that because you must know that prayer concerns God you must know that prayer is an activity that brings you into the orbit of God. And you wouldn't want to believe for a minute that God, even in answer to prayer, would be destructive or harmful or injurious. Therefore, what this minister experienced wasn't prayer. It was mental work mental treatment and he demonstrated beyond all doubt that you can use mental treatment and uh, grow plants beautifully and you can use mental treatment and wither them and destroy them don't ever let him convince you that that is prayer reserve the word prayer for something sacred, for something which has a God connotation, and then you will never have to be afraid of prayer, whether your own or the practitioner to whom you go. But once you accept prayer or mental work, you are accepting the possibility of good and the equal possibility of evil, and how are you to know how it's being used? Now, 
in our work of the infinite way we start with this understanding of the nature of God so that you will come automatically to accept the truth that God is forever functioning and God is forever functioning within you as you that God is forever about its own business of maintaining and sustaining harmony therefore you need not go to God for the solution of your problems you can turn within yourself and bring yourself into adjustment where the law of God can operate in you, through you, and for you. Now, not only all of the infinite way writings reveal these principles whereby we begin to bring ourselves into that adjustment so that we are the sons of God and we are under the law of God and the grace of God but all of the classes reveal it all of the tapes reveal it and you will have still more of it so please know this then that since God is infinite and eternal since God is omnipotence and since God is omnipresence, the presence and power of God is now and forever functioning within you. And the longer you dwell on this truth, the more you bring it into active expression. And so we come to this subject of which we also have this book practicing the presence now the purpose of the book practicing the presence is this it really is a fulfillment of scripture even though the title was given to us by brother Lawrence I learned the subject and the practice from scripture and then learned in my later reading that Brother Lawrence had beaten me to it and uh, had also written about it before I got around to it. Reminds me of uh, a practitioner whom I met some years ago. <clears throat> he had been introduced to the book The Infinite Way and uh, one night the first night that he had it he read it through from cover to cover and something hit him and so he read it through a second time from cover to cover before breakfast and then he said to his wife this man stole this book from me if I had written it <laughs> and of course brother Lawrence could be paying me royalties except that he did it first and if he were here I should be under obligation to pay him royalties the subject of the book is the greatest wisdom in scripture you will recall now as I repeat it to you thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. There you have it. That's the secret of practicing the presence. And uh, just as that Hebrew prophet discovered it was true, so did another one. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways he will give thee rest and there you have it again that is practicing the presence if you awaken in the morning and acknowledge that but for the grace of God you wouldn't have wakened 
you've practiced the presence of God. If you sit down to your breakfast and realize that but for the grace of God there wouldn't be cattle on a thousand hills or crops in the ground or diamonds or coal or oil aluminum, plutonium and all the rest of these things you will again be practicing the presence of God if you leave your home <clears throat> for any purpose and uh, get into an automobile or a bus or a streetcar or any other form of transportation and they realize that the grace of God is the mind of every driver on the road you are again practicing the presence of God whether you receive your income from a farm or an individual a business or whether you receive it from your husband or wife or child or parent if you can acknowledge that God is the source of it that without the presence and activity of God in human consciousness we might all be completely barren you are practicing the presence of God you will find yourself at peace if you can make a hundred opportunities during the day for the realization that whatever is transpiring is transpiring as an activity of God whether it's the sunshine or the moon the movement of the stars or the tides or even uh, that movement which we call time if you will realize a hundred times a day if you consciously bring to your remembrance the fact that the activity of God is responsible for every bit of harmony every bit of good every bit of support supply and law you will be practicing the presence of God you will be keeping your mind stayed on God and it will not be long before you will find yourself at peace it is a good thing of course to be grateful to uh, your farm or your husband or your wife or parent or child it is a good thing to be grateful to your practitioner or teacher but remember that that is only incidental to the true gratitude the true gratitude is uh, that which makes you realize that but for the grace of God there wouldn't be a spiritual teacher or practitioner but for the grace of God your mind would not have been turned to spiritual things you'd be out with the rest of the world through this practicing the presence of God you will learn why it is not necessary ever to pray God for anything or to do mental work for it because the very act of keeping the mind stayed on God eventually results in what we call realization sometimes it's called illumination now illumination isn't anything of a mysterious nature or even of an occult nature illumination really means light the receiving of light and light doesn't mean light in the physical sense but in the mental it means understanding awareness therefore when you are illumined it means only that you have received the actual experience of knowing God's presence knowing God's grace there's nothing emotional about it I can assure you and those who look for emotional experiences not only miss it but are apt to be led into occult experiences and like mental powers 
occult experiences can partake of the nature of good or of evil because all occult experiences are on the human plane even when they in involve personalities that have passed on from sight. That is why it is that some people have an occult experience which results in their being guided and directed from someone on the other side and uh, may even uh, be a great human blessing in their lives. It has happened many, many times. But <clears throat> they have no way of knowing what moment someone of evil entity or mental activity may enter that sphere because the occult, like the mental, is of the realm of both good and evil. Always remember this, physical power can be used for good and it can be used for evil. You can use your hands to pet or to punch, just to use an expression. You can use your hands to give or to steal. Physical powers may be used for good or evil. And uh, as we know from the history of all original races, and they are the ones who knew mental powers, mental power can be used for good or for evil. And as we have witnessed in the uh, case of Hitler's use of mass mental powers and uh, in some of our American officials who learned from Hitler how to use it, it can be evil as well as good. But when you reach the spiritual level, and now this is the very heart and soul of the infinite way, when you reach the spiritual level, neither physical evil nor mental evil can be experienced through you or by you. In other words, you no longer can be an instrument of evil to anyone, but you are also immune from physical and mental evils from any source whether individual or collective. You are only immune when uh, you have touched the realm of God. When uh, the Master said, the devil cometh and findeth nothing in me. That is the point to which you come. The devil comes, it may be in the form, it's always in the form of temptation, but it may be in uh, the temptation to be sick, the temptation to be poor, the temptation to be unemployed, the temptation to be lonesome or frustrated, the temptation to be unsuccessful, but it will not come nigh your dwelling place. You will have become immune. Now the human race is not immune. God can't save the human race. A thousand shall fall at your left hand and 10,000 shall fall at your right hand. It will not come nigh your dwelling place. Who, who is this your dwelling place? You who live in the secret place, who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. You are the only ones who are immune. You may think that this is a Hebrew psalm, and perhaps that particular Hebrew leader wasn't fully illumined. And so we will turn to the Master, Christ Jesus, and receive his confirmation. 
If you abide in me and let my word abide in you, you will bear fruit richly. If you do not abide in me or let my word abide in you, you will be as a branch of a tree that is cut off and withereth. And he was talking to his disciples. He was talking to his followers. But he was telling them that you cannot have the immunity from evil unless you are keeping your mind stayed on God, unless you are filling your consciousness with the activity of truth, unless you are abiding in the word of truth, unless you are acknowledging God as your life, your mind, your soul, even of the substance of your body. For even your body is the temple of the living God. And that is why as you progress in uh, your understanding and demonstration of the message of the infinite way, your body will shed some of its years. That inevitably follows because these years have been added to our frame not by the passing of time but by our absence from the house of the Lord and we have let the law operate upon us instead of grace the law of time the law of climate the law of food all these in the human sense are laws and therefore we in the infinite way do not claim this to be an absolute message because we do not claim that there are no such things as material laws and forces or mental laws and forces we know only too well there are and the world suffering from them but we acknowledge that in God contact neither material laws nor mental laws are operative none of these things shall come nigh thy dwelling place but the master never denied that they would come to this world he never denied that all of his people who did not keep their minds stayed on God he never denied that they would not be of those who wither he said only those will not wither only those will not die only those will live spiritually who abide in this word live in it not Sunday morning for an hour and not one evening a week at a tape meeting but be assured we must pray without ceasing therefore the entire message of the infinite way is aimed at encouraging us to meditate to ponder the Word of God to acknowledge him in all of our ways until in a moment that ye know not that ye think not the bridegroom cometh the actual experience of God contact takes place then if you prove faithful you will spend the rest of your days in a great deal of harmony wholeness completeness and fruitfulness and be prepared for even greater experiences when we leave this plane because our spiritual development does not keep us on earth in other words longevity has no relationship to immortality Jesus was only 33 years of age when he left this plane and the disciples were probably not over 50 but that had no influence upon their immortality we as uh, more is learned of the nature of the material and mental causes of disease and age will live longer spans on earth but that will have no relationship to our spiritual development in other words when I was a boy 
the uh, life expectancy according to insurance uh, policies was 50 years And those who lived to 70, of course, were looked upon as patriarchs and uh, men of great years. Now we have reached the age of 74 for women and 67 for men as life expectancy, but our New York Masonic bodies have been conducting experiments for quite a few years past in geriatrics and they now report that they have lifted the span to 82 and they are beginning to teach it to the medical people and they promise us that the generation now being born has an actual expectancy of 100 years without mental or physical deterioration. Not a hundred years as cripples, but a hundred years without physical or mental deterioration. So you see that our physical well-being will be continued for a longer span, but that has no relationship to our spiritual development. Our spiritual development may cause us to leave this plane at 30, or 40, or 50, or 60, if we are given a work to do, we may be one of those left here for a hundred. But passing from visible sight for those on the spiritual path is not death. It is a transition to a higher plane of work. All right, we're going to have that interval now.